Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? Awesome, awesome. Hey, I'm excited to be here with you guys. Man, it is so good to walk into 2024 in the same way we walked out of 2023 saying, all hail King Jesus. Amen? Amen. I love getting to worship with you guys. Now, as we enter into the new year, I do have several things that I want to celebrate from last year. You guys, this week we got to, as a church, send out $24,000 to our mission partners because of your generosity during the Christmas Giving Project. Thank you so much for being a generous church. Now, that money, listen, it got to go directly toward helping uh, women who are being exploited in the Middle East. It got to go directly towards resourcing pastors in, uh, in Nicaragua and Haiti. It got to go directly towards helping send our short-term mission team out to Nicaragua, where they are right now. You guys, we have 40 folks from our church in Nicaragua right now resourcing pastors and sharing the gospel in the most impoverished neighborhood in that entire country. How cool is that? That's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. Way to go, fellowship. On top of all of that, we had the single biggest day of Sunday services in the entire history of our church on Christmas Eve. We challenged you guys to invite your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers to come out and to hear about the good news of Jesus and to sing about the glories of the gospel at our Christmas Eve service. And that happened. We're, Fellowship Bible Church is impacting our community. That's good news. Amen? Amen. Hey, if you've been here for a couple of years, you know that our rhythm is to take the beginning of the calendar year and then the beginning of the school year to take one of our four core values and just to spend several weeks picking it apart. So a couple of Augusts ago, we got to talk about the gospel. We are a gospel church from top to bottom. If you're new with us, that's what you should know. We are a church that cares deeply about singing about the good news of the gospel in our worship time. We care deeply about hearing about the good news of the gospel in our sermon time. And we care deeply about living in light of the good news of the gospel all throughout the week. Here's the gospel. You and I are more messed up, sinful, and depraved than we're willing to admit. The rabbit hole of our sin goes deeper than we think. But Jesus, who is God, lived perfectly in our place. He died sacrificially for all of our sins. He rose triumphantly over enemies we were powerless to defeat on our own so that right now and in him we can be more loved, accepted, and delighted in than we could ever dare hope for. It is the good news of the gospel. And because it's true, we preach the gospel from every passage. Like every passage of scripture, Genesis to Malachi, Matthew to Revelation, ultimately points to the good news of a Savior who came to save us by his grace. We preach the gospel for every person. Like if you're far from Christ this morning, we love that you're here with us. But you should know, cards on the table, we want you to hear about the good news of Jesus and be changed by Jesus. If you've been following Jesus for decades... We're, we want you to hear about the good news of Jesus in fresh ways this morning and be changed by him as well. We preach the gospel at every level. Just so you know, over in Kids Life, do you know what they're doing right now? They're talking about the good news of God's grace. Do you know what they talk about at Fellowship Student Ministry on Wednesday nights? The good news of God's grace. We talk about it here. Our legacy group, 50 plus year olds, they're talking about the good news of God's grace. If you're new with us, we're going to talk to you about the good news of God's grace. Our staff and elder teams, we talk about the good news of God's grace. And we preach the gospel for every issue. Listen, at the root of every issue that you struggle with is ultimately a gospel issue. Which means the solution to every problem you have is ultimately a gospel solution. Church, does it get anybody else fired up that we are a gospel church? It's good news, isn't it? But that's not all. We're also a love church. We talked about love. Our lead foot as a church is love. We love those who love us, and we love those who don't. Our lead foot is love. In fact, one of the more radical things that Jesus uh, said to his disciples was related to how we should relate to our enemies. Do you remember what he said? He said we should mock our enemies. No, that, that wasn't it. He said we should belittle and demean our enemies. No, that wasn't it either. Hey, we should send snarky memes out about our enemies. No, that wasn't it. He said we should what? Love our enemies. Now, why would we ever do that? Because Jesus loved us while we were his enemies. While we were yet sinners, Romans 5, Christ died for us. And because Jesus moved toward us while we were still his enemies, we move toward every person you meet with love as well. Then, last August, we talked about truth. We are a church that sits underneath the authority of the truth of God re revealed in the Word of God. We said, listen, at, at some point, you're going to have to decide for yourself what your source of truth, what your authority in life is going to be. Some people in our culture look to experts for their source of truth. Some people look to what feels best or what works, but we look to Jesus 
He is the way, the truth, and the life. Where do we meet Jesus? Well, we meet him in the Old Testament that he endorsed, the New Testament that he commissioned, God's words, the Bible. And listen, this is unbelievably good news because the truth of God found in the word of God is the antidote to the anxiety of our age, the foundation of the freedom that we all long for. Now, that's who we are. We are a gospel church. We are a love church. We are a truth church. And if you've been here, if you haven't been here for two years, you may not have heard all of those particular series, but all of them are online on our app, on our website, or on our YouTube channel. You can check them out. But the next three weeks, we're going to pick apart our fourth core value. Our fourth core value is together. We are a together church. We are a church that worships Jesus shoulder to shoulder together. We're a church that does life shoulder to shoulder together. We are a church that that serves shoulder to shoulder together. That's true for our church overall. One of the things you're going to find as you leave and walk into the lobby is not everybody knows everybody else in the lobby, but most people know someone, and very clearly they're doing life with that person. That's true of every ministry team in our church. Every ministry leadership team in our church has folks serving shoulder to shoulder with one another, spurring each other on, and fighting to see every person together, following Jesus, engaged where we live, and involved around the world. In fact, all of this became especially obvious to me the week before Christmas Eve. The week before Christmas Eve, I was uh, on Wednesday, I think, I was, I was in this room and I was practicing my Christmas Eve sermon so I didn't say something dumb on Christmas Eve. And while I'm practicing my Christmas Eve sermon in here, out that door, 200 yards that way, Joe Lewis was building a gravel parking lot so that our staff and volunteers would have a place to park and we could free up spots for more people to have parking spaces out in the asphalt parking lot. And while Joe was building that asphalt parking lot, over in the conference room, we had our creative team working on some peripherals for a Ten Commandments series that's coming up this spring. It's going to be awesome, by the way. I'll tell you about it next week. And then while they're doing that in, in the conference room, we had Dan and Caleb putting together stuff for our kiddos so they'd have stuff to do at Christmas Eve. And while they were doing that, Carla was over here making sure we had enough candles and our hot chocolate bar was good to go. Do you know what that is? That's a whole bunch of people using their unique gifts and abilities so that as many people as possible here in this church might hear the gospel and be changed by Jesus. That's what it means to be a together church. Even more. I've been praying about this series for the last couple of weeks and preparing this sermon for for that time. And, And I am convinced that this series is unbelievably important for us right now in the history of Fellowship Bible Church. I've seen it a thousand times. When a church grows like our church is growing, togetherness is the place that the enemy is going to try to attack us, but not our church. I mean, I'm praying that this series would remind us that in a divided and contentious culture, we get the privilege of being a together church so that people might look in here and be compelled by Jesus. So to that end, here's what we're going to do next several weeks. We're going to open up our Bibles, and we're going to look at Ephesians 4. And in Ephesians 4, Paul is going to give us the foundation of a together church. Next week, he's going to give us the benefits of a together church. And then the week after that, he's going to give us the practices of a together church. Hey, I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump into Ephesians 4. Go ahead and pray with me. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you that you moved toward us before we ever moved toward you. You love us because you love us. That gospel good news has changed our lives. And God, I pray that in light of that gospel good news, we would be united together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. God, I pray that we would be a together church and that our community would look in here and see something so radically countercultural that they're compelled to ask the question, who is the savior of that place? And they would run to you. Jesus, help us to see you for who you are today. God, I pray that you help me get out of the way and that you would speak the truth that you want to to your people for your glory. Use my imperfect words to point to your perfect truth. We love you, Jesus. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, our culture, I don't know if you felt this, is increasingly segregated into affinity groups that all think alike, they, they talk alike, they view the world alike. On, on both sides of the political spectrum, for example, we have echo chambers. You know what an echo chamber is, right? These are groups of people in some setting who think the exact same way with very similar opinions and visions of life, just repeating the same thoughts, arguments, and justifications for what they already believe back and forth to one another. This is an echo chamber. 
And this is basically the set of any news broadcast you watch in our culture. It's people on a set who think alike, talk alike, view the world alike, broadcasting news to an audience that thinks alike, talks alike, and views the world alike. Many people in our culture have settled for fans rather than friends for this reason. What we really want, more than we want friends, is we want people to affirm in us what we already believe and what we're already doing. Even if what we think and do is ultimately harmful to us, that doesn't matter. So we surround ourselves with people who think alike, view the world alike, and talk alike. Some of us surround ourselves with people who think alike, talk alike, and view the world alike when it comes to our sports teams. Man, I'm on a text chain with some Mizzou fans, and they speak a completely different language than I speak. I mean, they're just like living in a whole different world. Can I get an amen from any non-Mizzou fans? It's a weird spot there. Even some of the places that brag about diversity in our culture are not really that diverse. Many college faculty, for example, are quite ethnically diverse, but they're not diverse intellectually, philosophically, or spiritually. Do you see what I mean? For as much as our culture talks about diversity, we tend to surround ourselves with people who think alike, talk alike, view the world alike. And that is until, if you happen to go to our church, until you step into our church. And I'm convinced that there is a diversity in this room unlike really anywhere else in our culture. I mean, there is geographic diversity in this room. What seems obvious to people in Fordland is less obvious to people in southwest Missouri. And once you get out to Republic, it's just a whole different world out there. My, my wife has said to me, Justin, I don't ever want to live somewhere where there are no sidewalks. Some of you guys have a special shotgun on a shelf for if anybody tries to build a sidewalk anywhere near your property. There is a background diversity in this church. This is one of my favorite things about our church. We have people with highly grimy pasts, worshiping shoulder to shoulder with people with highly moral pasts, and they're both worshiping because they've realized that salvation is found in no other name but the name of Jesus. There is age diversity in this church. One of my Favorite moments from December happened the first Friday of December. I was, I was over in the mix, which is the, the room over that way, and, and we had our legacy group having a Christmas party. So this is our 50-plus-year-old ministry, and they're all there. They're having a dinner together. They're doing a gift exchange. And you guys, there was a lot of laughing, 100, 100 or so 50-plus-year-olds all in the mix enjoying one another. And then I walked down the hallway to the worship center right here, and what I found is 150 or so of our young adults eating parlor donuts and getting ready to worship the Lord in uh, their young adults' large group gathering. How cool is that? There's theological background diversity in this church. Man, some of you guys grew up in churches where if you weren't dancing, you weren't worshiping. And others of you grew up in churches where if you were dancing, you were sinning. There's, there's hometown diversity in our church. We have people in this church worshiping shoulder to shoulder who grew up in Ava and Neosho, inner city Chicago and inner city Kansas City, Kuala Lumpur and Dalian, China, all worshiping shoulder to shoulder with one another in one place. I could keep going, but I don't think I need to. By almost every measure, this church is a diverse church. And as we begin this series, I need to name something. That's hard. The reason that people gravitate towards other people who think alike, talk alike, and view the world alike is that those people are easier. But if you're going to be a part of this church, you're going to experience the same English language spoken in very different ways. Alec Holloway, one of our young adult interns, walked up to me the other day, and he said the words, no cap, and expected me to understand what he meant. <laughs> I still don't know what that means. I just, I just nodded and pretended like I did. You're going to experience people with very different experiences in this church, which means that what seems obvious to you might be very much less obvious to them, and what seems obvious to them will be very much less obvious to you. You're going to experience people, listen, with very different opinions than you about any number of things in this church. So follow me. In a culture where we have segregated ourselves into groups of people who think alike, talk alike, view the world alike. That's our normal. In that kind of culture, what could possibly hold a church as diverse as ours together? Paul's going to show us in Ephesians 4. He's going to give us the foundation of a together church. He's going to give us the benefit of a together church. And then he's going to give us the practices of a together church. If you have your Bibles, meet me in Ephesians 4. We're going to start in, in verse 1. Paul writes this. I, therefore, pause for a second, 
That word, therefore, we're going to talk about in a second, is unbelievably important. If you like to underline your Bibles, let me just encourage you to like double underline that, put a star next to it. It's a very important word in Ephesians and, to be honest, for, in the entire Bible. I, therefore, Paul says, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul, in these verses, has given us three foundations for being a together church. And the first foundation is, is right there in that word, therefore. The first foundation for a together church is a common salvation. It's a common salvation. If you are here for our Roman series, you know that therefores in the Bible are massively important, and that's true of this particular therefore as well. You see, here's what's happening in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, Paul gives us gospel good news. He unpacks the goodness of the good news of the gospel. And then Ephesians 4 through 6, Paul tells us how we should live as Christians. So follow me on this. There's gospel good news, there's Christian living, and Paul connects the two of those things with the word, therefore. This church is revolutionary. Paul is saying that the Christian life is a life lived in light of and flowing out of the gospel. We receive the good news of God's grace, and then we live in light of the salvation that Jesus won for us, and we live in light of the salvation that Jesus won for us in every area of our lives. For our passage, do you see what this means? Paul is going to say that one of the ways that we live in light of the gospel, specifically in the church, is that we live united with brothers and sisters in Christ. Or can I say it in the opposite way? One of the sins of, of our day is living in disunity with brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. And part of what Paul would do to confront that sin is to say you should live more fully out of who you already are in Christ. See, the starting point for unity in the church is unity in salvation. Every Christian that Paul was writing to in Ephesus, every Christian in this room has experienced the exact same thing from the Lord in salvation. Follow me on this. You and I and every other Christian that you meet were dead in our trespasses and sins. This is Ephesians 2.1. We weren't a little sick in need of some medicine. Do you hear me? We weren't a little lazy in need of some motivation. We were spiritually dead in need of a miracle. You and I and every other Christian you meet have experienced that miracle. We were made alive by God because of his great mercy. Or as Paul puts it in one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. The fancy theological term for that is regeneration. Regeneration means that the transformation at the center of the Christian life is not primarily from bad to good. It's from spiritually dead to spiritually alive by grace. And God did that for us. He did for us. What we could not do for ourselves, Jesus died on a cross so that we might live in him. You and I and every other Christian we meet were saved by grace through faith, and it was all a gift of God. We receive salvation by grace. We could never earn it or deserve it. Jesus gladly gives it to us, and we're saved through faith. We trust in, treasure, and surrender to the Savior who died for us. You and I and every other Christian we meet were saved for works which God prepared beforehand. This is Ephesians 2.10. We don't work to earn salvation, but once we are saved, we get the privilege of using the ways that God has made us for his glory in works that God has already prepared for us. This is stunning, life-changing good news. Now follow me. If you're a follower of Christ... The gospel, this good news, is the most important thing about you. At the end of it all, when you stand before your maker, do you know what will not ultimately matter? Your political affiliations and political passions won't ultimately matter in that moment. Your social status or vocational accomplishments will not ultimately matter when you stand face to face with your maker at the end of time. 
Your good looks, your family success, your social media following will not ultimately matter. What will ultimately matter is that you were saved by grace through faith. In that moment, what will ultimately matter is that God, being rich in mercy, made you alive together with Christ. This is the most important thing about you, Christian. And here's how it connects to the sermon this morning. It is shared by every other Christian in this room. Every Christian you meet has been saved by God's sheer, unbelievable, life-changing grace. There are a thousand differences in this room and in our church, but Christians have the most important thing in common. We've been saved by God's sheer, unbelievable, and life-changing grace. We have a common salvation. And in my experience, too often, we forget that. Rather than spending our time in a community recounting just how staggering God's grace is for us, we spend our time talking about a smattering of secondary issues that we might disagree on. So we gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ and say, in essence, hey, hey, yeah, yeah, God's grace, that's fine. But what I really want to talk about is politics. Yeah, yeah, God's grace, that's fine. But what I really want to talk about is that theological controversy. And we begin to forget that we share the most important thing in common. So church, here's my challenge for you this morning. I've got three challenges. If you want to be a together church, if you want to join me in that, here's my first challenge. If you want to be a together church, I want to challenge you to commit this year to talking first and most about the gospel. In your community with brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to commit to talking first and most about the good news of God's grace for you. Do you know why? Because we have a common salvation. But that's not all. The second foundation of a together church is a common posture toward one another because of our salvation. We have a common posture toward one another because of our salvation. Look at verses 2 and 3. In verse 1, Paul says that we should walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. And then Paul doesn't leave us in the dark about what that means. Paul in verses 2 and 3 tells us exactly what it means to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. Listen to this. With our brothers and sisters in Christ, we should live with all humility and gentleness, with patience, Bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul is giving us what our postures should be towards other Christians. We have a posture of humility and gentleness toward one another. Humility means that we have a proper view of ourselves. We don't think too highly of ourselves. We don't think too lowly of ourselves. We have a proper view of ourselves. Here's the idea. We are so sinful that Jesus had to die for us. So we dare not think too highly of ourselves. And at the same time, Christian, you are so loved that Jesus gladly died for you, which means you dare not think too lowly of yourself. We also move toward each other with gentleness. That means we move toward each other with with care and tenderness rather than judgment and harshness because that's exactly how Christ moved toward us. We have a posture of patience toward one another. Church, do you know every person you meet is in process somewhere? Every person you meet is growing to be more and more like Christ somewhere. They have not arrived just like you have not arrived. In fact, every person you meet is likely growing in a hundred ways that you cannot tell just by looking at them. Or as Clayton likes to say, what you see about someone is merely a fraction of what is actually happening in that person's life. So we patiently walk shoulder to shoulder with one another as we all grow toward Christ. You got to hear me say this, especially in this part of our country. There is no expectation of perfection in this room because none of us have arrived, nor will we arrive until glory. Or as they say over in Fellowship Student Ministry, Fellowship Bible Church is a perfect place, listen, to be imperfect. We have a posture of bearing with one another in love. Whenever a married couple comes and talks to me about a particular problem that they happen to be having in in their marriage, one of the first things, whatever the problem is, one of the first things I will counsel them to do is to immediately and regularly begin serving their spouse. Now, does that fix all of their problems? No, it doesn't. But there, there are usually real problems that need to be addressed. But what it does do is it's very hard to hate someone you're serving. 
Something very similar is happening with our church, in my opinion. The same dynamic is true here. How do you grow to love people who are so different than you? Well, you bear with one another. You serve one another and watch your love for people or groups of people grow in this place. We have a posture of being eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. One of the places that this passage has been most challenging to me as I've been putting myself underneath the text all week has been that word eager. Eager means passion and priority. Eager means importance and intentionality. And Paul says we should spend our passion and our, our priority. We should focus with importance and intentionality, not on getting the, a platform for whatever our favorite issue happens to be. We should be uh, passionate and pri- give priority. The importance and intentionality should not be directed toward making sure people align with whatever opinion you happen to hold. Paul says that passion and priority, that importance and intentionality should be directed toward maintaining unity in God's church. Now, can you imagine what would happen if people in this room all moved toward one another with all four of these postures? So here's my second challenge for you. If you want to join me in being a together church, I want to challenge you to pick one of these postures and trust the Lord to move toward people in this church with that posture. As we enter into the land of New Year's resolutions, and I know there's probably lots of different opinions about the significance of New Year's resolutions in this room. I'm a New Year's resolution guy. As we move toward New Year's resolutions, what if one of these postures was one of your New Year's resolutions about how you're going to relate to your church? We have a common posture toward one another because of our salvation. But that's not all. Third foundation of a together church is a common theology flowing from salvation. Look at verses 4 through 6. Paul lists places where the church in Ephesus and our church must seek to maintain theological unity. Now, here's what's interesting. Paul could have listed any number of theological issues as the places where we need to maintain unity. But he lists specifically these issues as places where churches must maintain theological unity. So follow me on this. According to Paul, we are one body because we are united in our understanding of God. Did you notice? All three members of the Trinity are present in this list. We have the whole, God the Holy Spirit, one Spirit. We have God the Son, one Lord. We have God the Father, one God and Father. Our God, friends, is one God, three persons. This is the Trinity. And Christians don't have to understand every nuance of the Trinity, but we should maintain unity in the reality of the Trinity. According to Paul, we are one body because we're united in our understanding of salvation. Listen, we are saved by grace through faith. Let's be very clear about that. We are saved by grace. This is the one hope because of our call that Paul talks about in our passage. We don't work our way to God. He came on a rescue mission for us. We are saved through faith. We receive this salvation by trusting in, treasuring, and surrendering to the Savior who came on a rescue mission for us. And according to Paul, we are one body because we're united in our understanding of the proper result of salvation. You see, we've been made new by God himself. And so Christians walk in newness of life. This is represented in the one baptism that we partake in. And in fact, we got a baptism service coming up at the beginning of February. If you have not been baptized, we'd love to celebrate that newness of life with you at our baptism service. See, Paul is referring to something here that is true all across the Bible. The Bible itself distinguishes between doctrines that are of primary importance, doctrines that we maintain unity around, and theological doctrines about which there can be a diversity of opinion and conviction in the church. Paul has listed some of the doctrines that he considers to be primary importance. If you want to find the full list of what our church considers to be doctrines of primary importance, you can hop on our website and go look at our statement of faith. It's just right there. We're not hiding anything. We also spent a lot of time talking through what we consider to be primary in our home membership class. If you haven't ever walked through that class, we'd invite you to join us this coming February. Now, here's what matters for unity. Churches inevitably go sideways when they elevate secondary doctrines to a place of primary importance. This is the sin of Phariseeism. 
and they go sideways when they demote primary doctrines to a place of secondary importance. This is the sin of theological liberalism. Our elder team is committed to making sure neither of those two things happen for our church. You should be committed to that as well. So listen, here's my third challenge for you this morning. If you want to be a together church, which I'm asking you to join me in, at some point this week, especially if you're a member of our church, I'd love for you to hop on our website and read our statement of faith again. These are the doctrines that our church is united in. If you're just visiting our church, trying to figure out, hey, is this a church I want to be a part of? I'd encourage you to read the statement of faith too. You may not agree with all of those things, but at least you can know where we're coming from as a church. We have a common theology flowing from salvation. Here's the question for this morning, or the thought for this morning. What our divided world needs more than anything else is more together churches. As we grow, our temptation as a church is going to become to be divided over any number of issues. In fact, the sort of worldliness that many of us might be most tempted to is going to be division. But I'm committed to being a together church. And I'm inviting you to join me in that commitment. We are a church that's united because of our common salvation. We are united in our postures toward one another because of that salvation. And then we are united because of a common theology flowing from salvation. I'm going to pray, and we're going to take communion together. Pray with me. Jesus, I pray that you'd help us to live this. God, it's good news that we get to be a together church. There's something compelling about a church as diverse as ours being brought together in unity because of who you are. God, I pray that as our community would see the way that our church relates to one another, it would draw them to wonder about who our Savior is. That people would be drawn to Jesus because of the way that we relate to each other. So God, I pray that you would show my friends what it looks like to move toward one another in relationships. Specifically, challengingly even sometimes, God, that we would move toward one another. And we'd love each other because you loved us first. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for the gospel. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, underneath your seat, you have a communion pack that looks like this. Love for you to grab it. Begin to open it up. For all of the history of the church, Christians have reminded themselves that they are together with a common salvation, with common postures because of that salvation, and with a common theology flowing from that salvation. We've reminded ourselves of all of those things through communion. Christians have broken bread, and they've reminded themselves of Jesus' body broken so that they might receive forgiveness for every one of their sins. God pronounces Christian forgiven over you because of the broken body of your Savior, Jesus Christ. And Christians have taken a drink of wine or grape juice in our case to remind ourselves that Jesus allowed his blood to be poured out so that the stain of our sin might be washed away. Christian, God pronounces pure, holy, and righteous over you because of the blood shed by your Savior, Jesus Christ. And this communion was never meant to be taken alone as an individual response to an individual encounter with God. From the beginning, God's people have taken communion together to remind themselves that what marks this room is not how happy or cool we are. What distinguishes this room from a community organization or a country club is that we've been bought with the broken body and shed blood of our Savior. So listen, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, cards on the table, we would love for you to run to Jesus as the only Savior who saves and surrender to Jesus as the only Lord who leads to life this morning and then take communion with us for the first time. But if you're not ready for that, we politely ask you not to partake in this meal with us. We don't want to peer pressure you into doing some religious activity inauthentically. If you're a Christian and you have sin that you're not ready to repent of yet, that you're not really ready to give that up to God, you have relationships that are ruptured, that you're not ready to, to reconcile yet. We'd politely ask you not to participate in this meal either. We don't want to peer pressure you into doing some religious activity hypocritically. But for the rest of us, let's take a moment and remember the glories of the fact that Jesus came on a rescue mission for you. While you were dead in your sins, Christ came after you. God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made you alive together with Christ. You've been saved by grace and through faith. The gospel good news isn't just true, it's true for you. Take a moment and reflect on that, and then we'll take communion together in a second.
Hey, go ahead and pull out the wafer portion of your communion pack. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus broke bread and he handed that bread out to his disciples and said, hey, this bread represents my body broken for you. As long as you meet together, do this in remembrance of me. Now go ahead and open the grape juice portion. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took wine and he poured it into the glasses of his disciples and said, hey, this wine represents a new covenant in my blood. As long as you meet together, do this in remembrance of me. Hey, pray with me. Jesus, we thank you that the good news of the gospel is true. It's unbelievably good news for us this morning. So God, I pray for my friends who know you. God, I pray that they would feel the goodness of the good news of the gospel. And part of that good news is it gives us the power, the motivation to be united with brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. Thank you for that privilege. God, I pray that we would be a together church as a picture of just how good your gospel actually is. God, I pray for my friends who don't know you. God, I pray that they would run to you this morning as the only Savior who saves and the only Lord who leads to life because this gospel good news is, in fact, the best news in the history of the universe. We love you, King Jesus. Thank you for meeting with us again here this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.